2004, 5, 2011, 12 by 140 million. That's mm. a staggering decline in the numbers of the poor because sort of uh, wages had been rising and consumption expenditure rose. So obviously it means that people were ingesting, were taking in more food. Now let me pause and tell you the bad news. Mm. The bad news is that we've done precious little in this, uh, in all of this, in all the, this period in the last 10 years about sanitation. Mm. You cannot you know, give, the, give them the health services, give them the Anganwadi services, give them the food, and then they're defecating it all out into the open and uh, infecting each other. And, you know, they, they're not absorbing that food. So it's absolutely critical that this government, you know, revamps and revises completely. The new government completely needs to revamp the sanitation program. And I don't, I'm sorry to say, I regret to say that the new, new program on sanitation, the Swachh Bharat, um, is, is it's still folk using the design of the previous government. Mm. Let me pause there and sort of uh, <laughs> give the floor to my colleagues. <coughs> but you know, Dr. Prasad, that's, uh, that's where I, in fact, I also wanted to come to because uh, when the Prime Minister launches a Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, it is also about the fact that you have to clean the environs, you have to ensure that cleanliness becomes one of your important virtues, <coughs> you practice it and also tell your children that you are supposed to you know, have a clean environment around you. So, you know, educate them too accordingly. But we are a country, we are a part of that world which celebrates a global hand washing day. We have to educate our people about hand washing too. There are very little, little things which have to be taught. And that's where I guess, uh, Dr. Prasad, education, awareness, holds the most important key. Do you think it's really going to go very far? Because the, the call for cleanliness, has been, I, I'm sure that has been there for a very, very long time. But the fact that, you know, now it has been, it has been given a push by the center, does it give it a new dimension altogether? Or do you think it is, uh, it is just going to remain as a slogan and merely may not be really making that sort of impact that it's intended to? See, I would say that a, a slogan is a, a good beginning. <coughs> having a slogan is better than not having a slogan. And you know, making an issue of certain things is 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 good. So making an issue of malnutrition, uh, something that we started doing not too long ago, uh, was good. And that then that leads to other things. And so certainly making an issue of hygiene and sanitation is good. But I am a little concerned about a very simplistic understanding of this. You know, uh, there are things to be done at household level, family level, individual level, for sure. There's no doubt about it because of a lack of consciousness uh, in the general uh, community about many of these issues that's that's fair hmm. but there are many larger issues also you know they are the it's not just poor people who are spreading bad hygiene around and uh, all the country is suffering as a result of that and their own selves as well uh, i think we have to start with the uh, uh, the social responsibility of corporations and how they're treating the environment, how we, what we've been able to do with our, uh, you know, environmental resources, the rivers, <coughs> the forests, and uh, and so on and so forth, the land. Um, so I think it's much larger than uh, just a household level thing of teaching people how to wash hands. Um, there are there are going to be the minute with all behavior change communication, there is a limited gain that you get from just the. Uh, tra uh, just uh, transmitting information or knowledge mm -hmm. because then you come up to structural barriers, systemic barriers. That's right. For example, if we say that you must uh, wash and you must wash your hands, do we not know the time use studies are telling us how hard women are having to struggle, not just women but also children, to gather water. Mm. In just the slums around Delhi, one third of Delhi is a slum. That's right. It is a laborious and really uh, a task of survival to mm. get water for the family. If you look at water consumption between middle class households and slum households, it would be 40 times more in middle class households, the wastage of water, etc. So I just want to break this idea that, you know, um, th that we can easily make this kind of a class distinction that, you know, poor people don't know how to wash hands and don't know uh, how to uh, be more sanitary. Hmm. Uh, I think that the, the issues are much, much larger in terms of equity, equitable distribution of resources. Um, and uh, we need to think like that. Hmm. Now, coming back to program, uh, programs that we launch, you know, I think there's some key principles that we continuously uh, evade and we are flawed on, and that's why these programs are not successful. Swachh Bharat may also fall into the same trap. Unless we decentralize, 
unless our base is from the community and it's a it's a bottoms up approach and especially in toilets if you look at evaluations of all these toilet programs that have happened we built toilets beautiful looking things which have been used as storehouses because they never fulfilled the the requirements that that particular community had so uh, i think uh, bottoms up programs decentralized programs flexible programs that take people into trust uh, and that work with people and so they have to be community centered community owned community based as far as possible decentralization is the key whether we speak of malnutrition or whether we speak of hygiene and health and sanitation and all that we are not talking to our people our own people that's right and that's where comes the the performance of states and the the experiences with different states also vary much of it also rests with the the administration at the state level and of course local governance is a very very key issue but look at the way our urban local bodies function in the country till date we talk about strengthening them not really giving them enough powers so that's where you have some examples where uh, the ulbs must be really working well the panchayats must be really doing well but then at large uh, you know i mean largely if you look in the country either they don't have the funds or they don't have the plans or they don't have enough resources uh, dr menon do you think that there's a there's a lot of gap between what we are trying to say what we are preaching here and what we are practicing and that gap has to be bridged that's your uh, you said it right there um but I, i i really want to emphasize this issue of the states and the communities and the and the districts the issues that that vandana was raising because i i think firstly that's where things are happening that's where things clearly have to happen you know what what we say here what somebody says in delhi has to happen in the house of a poor woman sitting in in the middle of singroli district in mp right so keep that in your mind and that's where decentralization comes in that's where state level governance comes in and that's where the story of of nutrition and hunger in india is if you look at you know the the data situation firstly where which would allow us really to unpack this and understand it a little bit better is fairly abysmal mm. we have one number here on the underweight we need to see what the rest looks like we need to look at where there's been change where there hasn't been change and then try and understand where that has come from but once we do then the action also happens at that level right so at some level one is going to have to work closely with states to say look what are the gaps in in one state versus the other the issue of open defecation the issue of women's education those issues vary quite a lot mm. across india mm. you know in in the southern states um we've done pretty well on on women's education you've done fairly well on dimensions of economic growth again something that we we can't forget because it does put resources uh, like santosh was saying in in people's pockets it puts resources in in the state government but there's nothing like um, a perfect state that we see there's nothing country. like a perfect nothing state like and there likely state. is is not a perfect country as well anywhere in the world you know brazil did very well on on under nutrition and is losing the battle against obesity so you know no, there's I, there's right, a long way mean, to go on on, right. on any of these that's right. but but i think we we have to focus in on on having firstly a learning agenda you know what we end up with in in several of these contexts is people think they know what is happening in x state or y state we don't invest enough in saying you know what really happened can we learn that can we do the research on what needs to be done and and you know uh, largely dr prasad if i ask you uh, wherever we have seen a growth uh, in terms of all these indicators do you think that it's largely the the effect of states administration the state government their proactiveness that has resulted in it i think the different factors one would find in different situations and i i must say that one can't forget the role of uh, civil society of community mobilization and many of those processes have happened uh, there have been you know the the good models for example which have actually been born out of severe crises so uh, melghat you know and that uh, whole experience over there uh, where the government stepped in and created a you know completely different structure to help with malnutrition in a particular area because deaths were going on and on happening in a, in an area um like i said odisha has you know shown some way ahead in decentralization because uh, there's there's also a political vision that mm. you know uh, makes a difference so if um, if uh, the the political leaders of a particular state 
uh, are quite committed to decentralization, for example, hmm. then all policies flow from that. Hmm. If in Tamil Nadu, food has always been uh, uh, on the political agenda in some manner or the other, then uh, the ICDS has worked uh, you know, as a model for decades before. Now we're talking about uh, things happening in other states. So hmm. I think that um, political vision, uh, uh, because some of these things that we're saying, like decentralization, comprehensiveness, uh, rights, equity, uh, these are not necessarily technical issues. Hmm. So if they inform then our uh, uh, programs and policies as key principles, fundamental principles within which we must house the technicalities and uh, the specific programming, Mm. which take into account the uh, context, which are context specific, then I think that is what basically makes a difference. And um, this has worked to lesser or more extent everywhere, but as Purima is saying that we haven't really seen the full model at work uh, in any state in, <laughs> in any uh, so state. far. Yeah. Right. But you know, Dr. Mehrotra, what's also very important since we touched at the issue of uh, poverty too, people should really have the money, <coughs> enough money to buy, afford these things. And uh, you know, food is of course, it, it, you really need to have some pennies in your pocket if you want to eat well. And it is not about eating some sort, uh, you know, a couple of eggs maybe in a month or a, in a week, but it is also about expanding it to a daily routine. And that's where I guess the question of affordability comes. Dr. Mehrutra, do you think, in fact, there had been a drive of, uh, you know, a few uh, people from the intelligentsia have written to the government that the MG and REGS should not be scrapped. Not just about that scheme, but about the rest of the other themes. And also looking at the fact that more employment opportunities can be generated. Do you think that's also directly would be, uh, you know, helping people and the country improve its, uh, you know, its performance on these indices? You ask a difficult question. <laughs> Let me explain why. Um, about uh, eight years ago when Mandrega started, I was actually the head of the Rural Development Division in the Planning Commission. And I was a great votary of it and, 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 and worked hard on it and we, we, we did very well. However, many of us were at that time already convinced that uh, very rapidly taking the program to the whole country wasn't exactly the best idea. There are labor surplus districts in our country and there are labor scarce districts in our country. If we were to focus our attention and our money and our financial resources, in the, particularly in the labor uh, surplus districts, rather than fritter it away all over the country, it would be more effective in the Koraput, Bolangir, Kalahandi, etc. kind of districts of this country. Mm -hmm. I'm just giving these as examples. So w all I'm saying is that this is, th there, that Mandrega has played a great role. It should continue to exist. It does need some reform, some modification. I, I don't think this is the program to sort of go into that into, right. into much That's detail. Right. But there, there is no question about it that there, there are significant parts of this country, including in the poor UP and in Jharkhand and Bihar and so on, where people have uh, uh, are finding work outside <coughs> of agriculture outside of the rural areas and even <coughs> in non-farm activities in rural areas because construction work is booming and that's where agricultural workers uh, agricultural workers are moving out to as it is and as a result of that wages in agriculture itself have risen you know the, the, uh, mandrega led to one a one-off increase in wages however the continued and sustained increase in wages that have taken place in rural areas post 2005-06 have been driven by the fact that alternative employment was becoming available both in rural as well as in urban areas, particularly in construction. So these factors need to be kept in mind. Mm. I am I am not suggesting that you can you should be winding up Mandrega. Far from it. In particular uh, parts of the country, it is still very desperately needed. But we also know we have to look at the facts. The, mm. fa the facts are that that there is less demand for it, the number of person days per, per household being generated every year according to the Ministry of Rural Development's own numbers have been declining and the Ministry of Rural Development's own numbers uh, on respect to person days uh, uh, of work generated is actually much higher than what the NSS told us, the National Sample Survey. So the, po the point I'm making is that, you know, 
the economy is evolving and there are alternative uh, uh, employment opportunities uh, becoming available. Other, if that was not happening for the last 8 to 10 years, mm. you wouldn't see the poverty decline in poverty. And mm. that, that uh, uh, employment increase outside of agriculture must be sustained and this government's focus does need to return to that. The Make in India slogan mm. must also be no, must be not just concerned about making in India, but making you know making uh, by the, the 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 manufacturing must be focused on small and medium enterprises where the jobs are generated. That's right. So that's that's very important, not just the, construction. At the same time, you need enough food grains. I mean, you know, that, not, that push to I'm agriculture not denying is that. also required. No, but the, the agricultural growth rate has improved. We should also learn lessons from states which have done well in agriculture, like uh, Andhra Pradesh, like Gujarat. We should be, you know, other states should be learning lessons from that. Why mm. isn't UP sort of learning that lesson? I don't understand that. Mm. Because, I mean, I find it utterly shocking that UP's agricultural growth rates are as low as they are, and despite the fact that 70% of their agricultural land is irrigated. And we, we, we live in a country where there are a number of farmer suicide that uh, takes place, where, where the sugar farmers, the other farmers keep agitating because they don't get enough of their produce. And the input prices of the agriculture is an additional burden on the farmers, along with, of course, monsoon. Dr. Prasad, you wanted yeah, to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to bring in another very uh, little heard nuance on this Narega story, which is not, you know, the, from the economist's point of view at all. But basically, when we program for children, um, migration is a key, key issue. Mm. Uh, so whether it be for education, for preschool, for feeding programs, for care, uh, migration is a critical uh, bottleneck and a problem mm. for programming for children. And uh, we have seen that Narega has halted migration outside of these very, very uh, desperate and dire circumstance kind of areas in India. So I think that we have to keep that in mind. I, I, I'm not debating between you know using labor for agricultural purposes or non-agricultural purposes, but all I'm saying is that for children where, where families are concerned. They should be a permanent work, source of income generated. Work has to be close to home. And the, and the work has to be close to and home. And the money should be better than what yeah. uh, you know some states are yeah. giving. Yes, yeah. uh, Dr. Menon, you want to so say something? I, I wanted to, you know, We've talked a lot about issues at sort of the level of households, levels of communities, but I want to talk about the issue of leadership. Uh -huh. Because when you talk about social equity, when you talk about improving nutrition, when you talk about improving hunger, and you have situations where you have so many different things that cause it. You know, Santosh talked about the food health care. Now, food gets delivered to, through two ministries, three ministries. There's agriculture, there's food and civil supplies, there's, there's all these things. So what you need is somebody that says, look, I just, want this to be an issue, mm. I want equity to be an issue, and that's where leadership comes in. If we look at countries, and even if we look at states within India, where these changes have happened, where situations have improved, there have been leaders, there have been champions, they have paid attention to issues of mm. equity as a whole. Mm. So I think <coughs> the other thing that we really need to see from this government at the national level, but also from the tough state, you know, state governments, states mm. like UP, states like, like Bihar, where it's going to take quite a lot more to move all of their indicators. I think you need some really strong leadership there. Mm. You need a strong leadership that's paying attention to this as an issue. That's right. But uh, we, we are also moving towards the right to food, and that's where, you know, we have seen the, uh, the food, uh, the... National Food Security Mission kicking uh, up, and there we have seen some uh, some states really moving ahead with that. But what's there, Dr. Mehrutra, with some states wh who are not really able to meet the deadline? We have just seen it being postponed months after months. But looking at the fact, do you think now it's really expanding? And pe uh, this this government also has the vision. The previous government also had a vision regarding that. And do you think it's it's really going to be a reality? No person I, in this country will die because of hunger. I can see that you, you pose the most difficult questions <laughs> to me. Um, uh, let me see if I can sort of handle this. Uh, you see that the, the uh, you know as well as I do that um, the, PDA, the National Food Security Act was passed towards the end of the previous regime. Uh, it was supposed to be rolled out from uh, around July onwards this year <coughs> in the whole country. Uh, well, it was slowly rolled out before that, but it was supposed to be, sorry, covered by, it was supposed to be covering the whole country by about July this year. Right. That timetable has been, has completely gone off the, 
uh, the chart. Um, why is this? Well, I'm not surprised that this is the situation because states have not done their bit to reform PDS. If they don't reform PDS, if you ro roll out the National Food Security Act, uh, then you know you will be simply throwing more good money after <laughs> after bad. Mm. That's not a very good idea. So clearly, what is absolutely critical is that the PDS reform that all of us are agreed upon should happen mm. needs to be rolled out in every state. Mm. We all know that certain states have have rolled out reform; they have done very well, and. The mo a very significant proportion of the, of the remaining states have not. Mm. So th unless we fix that problem, it's a bit unlikely that the NFSA is going to become a reality by, by the end of financial year you know, 2015, mm. meaning by March 2015. And it's an absolute and dire necessity that those, those PDS reforms happen. Uh, as as rapidly as is possible. Okay, Dr. Prasad, uh, I'll have uh, last one minute on the show. What are your concluding remarks on the right to food? Do you think that's going to be a reality in near future? And do you think India would be free of this uh, curse called hunger? I think it must. <laughs> I mean, there's just uh, no case to to say anything but that we must all commit ourselves very fully, and we must push our governments as solidly and as strongly as we can. We must be as strident in our demands for the right to food uh, for all people. You know, it's not it's elderly, it's children, it's uh, people with disability, it's everybody. I don't see how this growing economic giant can get away by saying that you know we are just simply going to allow people to rot without food, to starve children, not to get a uh, decent meal a day. So these are just not uh, uh, realities that one should swallow at all in this country. And I, I really would really hope that the middle class engages with this much more strongly. You know, this the equity issue that we've continuously been raising as a panel all together um, is something that uh, uh, somehow has been very sanitized. I mean, uh, the people have very conveniently forgotten uh, what poor people are, uh, how they're living, how they're eating, how they're shitting. Uh, you know, so I think that there needs to be a much greater engagement uh, with the equity issue, with saying that yes, these are our uh, families and our brothers and sisters out there, mm. not some different population That's who's right. actually causing us a great uh, difficulty right. in this country. That's right. So it's very important to res uh, to realize our responsibility and also behave like a community when we say it is community's responsibility. Thanks very much for joining us. Quite a pleasure having you all here. That's all we have for you in this edition of Public Forum. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.